Hi everyone. In this talk, I would like to talk about a domain-specific language for name modifiers. The reason we are doing this is because we want to build a proof assistant. So I have been personally involved in building REPL and RedTT and CoolTT, and recently I've been working on LGTT. Each of them has its own purpose. So our goal is not to build a perfect proof assistant that we can live in forever. Our goal is to build the next 700 proof assistants. So after building uh, a few proof assistants, we realized that there is a serious problem. The thing is, there is a big difference between a type checker, the, the core that is probably using normalization by evaluation, and a real proof assistant that will actually assist you to complete a proof. In order to make a real proof assistant, you probably want to implement many items on this slide. Uh, and this talk is about one of them, which is the named spaces. Before moving on, I would like to thank the program committee and the reviewers for recognizing the importance of this work, even though uh, it doesn't really have any theoretical contribution in terms of making new type theories or proving new theorems. I do think it's very important for us to improve the infrastructure so that all of us can easily turn our favorite type theory into a tool that we actually want to use. So we built an OCaml library for namespaces and identified quite a few principles that I will discuss. And the goal of this talk is to convince you that when you build your next proof assistant, you should consider our library. The first principle is to be expressive. Um, so this is kind of obvious because you do want to make sure that you can do the things that you could do in other popular programming languages. Here is a pseudo egg.code code that is opening a namespace M using only the binding A or renaming the binding A to B or hiding the binding B. Um, so Already from this syntax, um, in order for our language to be expressive, we should also be able to select some bindings from the namespace uh, to rename bindings or to hide some of the bindings. However, there is a serious problem in this syntax. In fact, EGDA will reject this example. The problem is that the order of execution matters. For example, if you rename A to B before hiding B, then in the end, the renamed A will still be hidden. However, if you hide B before renaming A to B, then the renamed A will survive, and in the end, you will have the renamed A as B. So since the result depends on the order of execution, EGDA simply rejects this example. That's one way to do it. But I think it's better to allow the user to specify the order. So once again, the fundamental issue here is that modifiers are effectful. And here comes our second principle, which is to have explicit sequencing to allow the user to specify the order. And so that's our second principle. And now I'm going to start motivating our third principle, which is to have implicit namespaces. Um, so here is a piece of OCaml code. And the reason that we are um, opening a, a standard module list as something and rebind the list to uh, the, this augmented module is because we want to support 
multiple versions of OCaml. So very often, in the later version of OCaml, the standard library has some new functions defined there that we want to use. And a, an easy way to support multiple versions is to define the new functions by ourselves. And so here it is. So the new fun is the new function introduced in the later versions of OCaml. And so the one way to make our program compatible with multiple versions is to just introduce this piece of code um, in our own code base. So this kind of works, but it has lots of caveats in practice. So I have been thinking that, can we just write let list that new function equal something as a way to inject new function into the namespace directly. So this will not work in OCaml, OK actually for good reasons. But we can change how our proof assistants work so that we can inject things directly in a namespace. The reason that OCaml OK and standard ML do not allow you to arbitrarily override something in a namespace is because they are using modules to implement namespaces. And the module in those languages has a typed interface, which is called signatures. So signatures are very useful because it allows you to quantify over an unknown module. So that's why you can write a functor which taking an unknown module of some signature. So that's very good, uh, but it also creates new burdens. Um, because now you have to make sure that for all the operations you want to define on modules, the resulting modules still need to have a valid signature. Uh, for example, uh, on the left hand side, this is a signature. So it has a type T and the value X of type T. Um, so consider a, a module implementing this signature. You cannot just remove the type T because otherwise the value X will not have an expressible type. So it's a good thing to have an interface, but then it becomes a burden to make sure that there's always an interface. And also in the context of the proof assistance, sometimes you cannot even uh, have a type. Um, for example, if you have a predicate universe hierarchy and you also support universe polymorphism, then a definition that is polymorphic in the universe levels will not have an internalized type. So you cannot even write down a type for that module. So there are people trying to identify the operations you can still define on modules while maintaining signatures. For example, the ICFP paper here on the slide. But I think there is an easier solution to this problem, which is to have a separate notion of namespaces that is different from modules. And a namespace does not have to have an interface. So here is our slogan. Modules are types. They are like records. Namespaces are not. Going back to our motivating sample, so we come up with a notion of implicit namespaces, which becomes our third principle, um, which is to understand namespaces as groups of bindings whose names happen to share a common prefix. For example, on the left hand side, we have three bindings. The first one being m.a, the second one being m.a.x, and the third one being m.a.y. These three bindings form a namespace m.a, even though I didn't specify I didn't explicitly specify the namespace m.a anywhere. They form a namespace simply because they have the same prefix m.a. So this design 
seems to give us the maximum flexibility to inject something in the namespace, something into the namespace, or change something in the namespace. The next principle is to help prevent user typos. And we have found two mechanisms that seem to be helpful. The first one is to detect empty namespaces. This matters when, for example, the when the user specifies that they want to use a namespace A. And remember that under our implementation of namespaces, a namespace A is just a group of bindings with the prefix A. So when the namespace is empty, it means that there's no binding with the prefix A. And so and if that's the case, then it becomes very suspicious and maybe the user user actually makes a typo. So it seems helpful to, to check whether the namespace is empty in various cases. The next mechanism is to make sure that unions are explicit. Um, so this would matter when, for example, when the user is saying that they want to rename the namespace A into a namespace B. Um, so our suggestion is to hide the existing bindings with the prefix B after the renaming. The reason that the reason is that otherwise it will be very confusing whether the resulting binding with the prefix B is coming from the original namespace B or the namespace A. That said, we don't want to prevent the user from making a union. Uh, we just want to make sure that the unions are explicit and the user has to uh, make explicit union uh, if they want the union. The next principle is to have a relatively small kernel and our design only has six constructors. And the first one is to check whether something is empty uh, for the typo detection we just discussed. And if you don't care about that, uh, you only need five. And the last one is to provide a mechanism to to extend the language with plugins. If you don't need that either, you only need four. So all the features we have discussed can be implemented using these four basic constructors, uh, which is the scoping, uh, which is to apply some uh, some modifiers to a sub namespace, the renaming, the sequencing operation that we have discussed, and the union. Everything can be implemented using only these four. The final principle is to use algebraic effects. I don't really have a good defense, except that uh, the code is, looks much nicer than the old code that uses uh, monads and the OCaml OK 5 alpha 0 is just out uh, with some support of algebra effects and so there are really no excuses that you are not trying it out. So here's a recap of the six principles uh, we just discussed. So we have been using these principles when building our OCaml OK library. There are many things I didn't talk about. For example, the Racket language has its own DSL for importing things, and their language is quite close to ours. Uh, the, the other thing is the lexical scoping. Uh, so I didn't talk about how to have uh, nested uh, lexical scoping and also how to specify whether something is public or something is private. Um, so we actually have an implementation of lexical scoping supporting all of this. And you can just use that directly. And yet another thing is a detection of unused imports and unused definitions. It's actually quite tricky to, uh, to detect these efficiently. So in order to do that, uh, we actually devise a, a quite fancy data structure for namespaces so that we can detect unused imports or definitions uh, quickly. 
So please use our library to write yourself a proof assistant and tell us how you think about it. Thank you.